be quiet. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 14877 in the name of Ian Gray on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Tapping All Our Talents 2018 Progress Report of Women in STEM. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Could I ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Ian Gray to open the debate. Mr Gray, please. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, in 2012, the Royal Society of Edinburgh published this, the first Tapping All Our Talents report. This was the most comprehensive analysis of gender inequality in science in Scotland. And its findings were perhaps not surprising, but some were shocking. Its conclusions showed just how poor we are at recruiting women into STEM subjects and careers. Perhaps its most damning statistic was that even where women overcame all the barriers in their way and did study STEM subjects to a graduate level, 73% of them did not then go on to pursue a career in STEM. Their skills, their training, their intellect and their talent was simply lost to this critical sector. The report quickly became the seminal research informing the debate around uh, addressing this criminal waste of talent. And it should have been a wake-up call uh, of how far we had to go or have to go in involving and improving the position of women in STEM, not just as a matter of basic justice and fairness, but also as an economic and social necessity. Indeed, the RSE estimated that doubling women's contribution to the STEM workforce could be worth as much as £170 million to Scotland's national income. Tapping All Our Talents made a number of recommendations how improvements could be made so that young women had the opportunities to progress and excel in STEM and make it their chosen career path. So six years on, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has returned to this issue uh, to research what, if any, progress uh, has been made uh, and produced Tapping All Our Talents 2018. And there has been some progress. For example, the highly regarded Athena Swan programme to address gender equality uh, is now operating in 73 science and medicine departments uh, around Scotland. And that is up from five in 2012. UK-wide, uh, the proportion of women in core STEM professions has risen from 13% to 23%. But the RSE report shows that in some areas of further and higher education, at best, we have seen only slight improvements with regards to women in STEM, such as a 2% increase in undergraduate engineers. But at worst, and in many areas, we've seen further decline. And that is indeed confirmed by Scottish Labour research published today, which shows that in IT-related college courses, such as computer science and software development, there has been a significant drop in the number of women enrolments, a worrying trend for ensuring a high-skilled high -skilled skills pipeline. But the most worrying evidence in this year's report probably comes from schools. There, we still see the impact of gender stereotypes in STEM having an impact on uptake and opportunities, with no real progress at all being made since 2012. Once again, in the critical area of computer-related studies, we see the starkest gender gap, with young women studying these subjects at levels uh, national three to five, plummeting from 32% to 18%, while the percentage of girls sitting in exams uh, in these computer-related qualifications at higher level fell from 25% in 2012 to 16% last year. Meanwhile, the proportion of girls taking physics at levels three to five and sitting physics exams at higher also fell over the same period. Indeed, despite the fact that many STEM subjects in schools have women underrepresented in the classroom, we should note carefully that every single subject sees women with better attainment levels than men at National Five. Every single subject. The gender gap in STEM has nothing to do 
with aptitude. It has nothing to do with women's brains being different or their skill set unsuited to STEM. It has everything to do with attitude, conscious and unconscious bias, and systemic everyday sexism. It has everything to do with men like Professor Strumia from CERN, who notoriously claimed <coughs> physics was built and developed by men and it is not by invitation. Tell that to Professor Sheila Rowan, Scotland's <coughs> chief scientific advisor and a major contributor to the detection of gravitational waves. Professor Rowan is a tremendous role model for women in STEM, but we need more than women being role models. We need men to address their attitudes and quickly. Now the RSE are planning a range of follow-up work to this progress report. In early April, they will continue the conversation through an exhibition that showcases women in science in Scotland, celebrating their achievements, but also highlighting the work that still needs to be done to address gender inequality in STEM. They also plan a series of roundtable discussions with representatives from across the education, third sector, business and government sectors to discuss the issues raised in the report and what can be done by organisations working together to deliver gender equality. This time, Tapping All Our Talent report's recommendation goes deeper than the need for programmes such as Athena Swan, valuable though they continue to be. This time, the report demands a focus on behavioural change to really recognise the gender equality and to really recognise gender equality in STEM for everyone and to render bias and discrimination simply unacceptable. And above all, it demands leadership to achieve this from government, from industry, from educators and colleagues from all of us. Not warm words nor empty rhetoric, but support for real action and a willingness to confront the biased discrimination and sexism which stops us tapping all the talents that we must bring to bear on our scientific future. It may cost money. It will certainly take a more concerted effort than we have been willing to make up until now. It will certainly upset Professor Strumia and his ilk and all the better for that. But we cannot afford to ignore the wake-up call of ta tapping all our talents this time around. Thank you very much, Mr Gray. I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Miss Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Ian Gray on bringing this motion to the Parliament and having the opportunity to debate this today? Um, the 2012 Tapping on Talents report is one that I have used on many occasions to inform debates in this chamber, and it was a, a really important piece of work. And I, too, welcome the review and the republication in 2018. I, and um, uh, Professor Anne Glover is the RSE president who does the forward, and Professor Leslie Yellow Lees was the chair of the committee looking at that, um, and two of the foremost um, women scientists we have in our country, and certainly role models for young women in Scotland. I too welcome some of the um, uh, improvements that have been noted in the report. The proportion of female STEM graduates in the UK has increased from 27% to 30%. Uh, the current rate of progress in STEM, FTSE 100 com companies in expecting to be a voluntary target of 33% of women on boards uh, by 2020. Um, I, I do find some of these targets quite worrying though. As someone who supports the Women 5050 uh, campaign for representation in politics, I do um, find that hard because effectively what they're saying is they're content of 66% as men. And I think you turning that argument around sort of exposes how, how um, unequal the um, position is for women in some of these organisations. Um, in academia, the number of Scottish STEM including medicine departments holding Athena Swan as mentioned by Ian Gray has increased. And this also the proportion of professors in mathematics has trebled female professors um, from 3% to 10% and chemistry doubled from 5% to 10%. So there are progresses being made. 
although there is much, much work to do. Um, can I point to another important report, Automatic for the People, which was produced by the SEDI uh, in conjunction with BT, Scot Scotland IS, representative of the information systems um, uh, community in Scotland, and also with the RSE as well. And, it, it, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us already. And um, we have to ensure that Scotland our communities, our economy, are geared up for taking advantage of what is coming our way. And, um, but by way of highlighting that, the Fraser Valland Institute is quoted in that report, and they have um, conducted research to show that um, of the 2,826,000 2, jobs in Scotland, 837,290 of those, almost a third, are going to be impacted by the fourth industrial revolution, digital technology and sensor technology. And what we want is for Scotland to be leading in this area. And that means we need people to come through at schools, at universities, at all levels and study STEM subjects. Now I know that um, the government has done a number of uh, areas to support this. Our own uh, education skills committee um, is hoping to uh, conduct uh, a review of the STEM strategy. Um, the government's due to publish that and I look forward to hearing when that might be available. And um, we have got examples like census um, supported by the, the Scottish government, which is the centre of excellence in the world for sensor and imaging technology. We have an opportunity, but in order to maximise that on opportunity for high pro highly productive, highly paid jobs in Scotland, we have to ensure that all our young people are aware of the opportunities and that women who want to study and work in this area are given all, every opportunity to support them in their ambitions to work in STEM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Adamson. I call Alexander Burnett to be followed by James Kelly. Mr Burnett, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by joining members from across the chamber and congratulating Ian Gray for bringing this motion, welcoming the publication of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's report, Tapping All Our Talents, Women in Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Uh, and I also wholeheartedly support the society in raising this important issue of gender equality in STEM. The report has found a significant gender gap within STEM leadership roles and little progress in the proportion of women studying STEM subjects in colleges and universities. And having read this briefing, along with other reports, the importance of STEM is clear, as is the impacts and causes of lost talent in these fields and actions the Scottish Government must take. Now, currently, Scotland's reputation in science, technology, engineering and mathematics is strong, and these fields are a key sector of our economy. But unfortunately, in our schools, we have seen female participation decrease in many STEM subjects, such as computing and physics. An early and sustained intervention is essential to inspire interest in STEM by young students of all genders. Furthermore, we are concerned that many women are discouraged from pursuing STEM careers. And in today's society, women face obstacles to participating and progressing in science and technology careers. And these barriers include family responsibilities, implicit bias, and lower access to research funding. And even if women do pursue STEM subjects, we find that many highly qualified women are leaving the sector early. And to add insult to injury, even when they do stay, women are consistently underrepresented at the executive level. Now, why does this matter? Well, our economy is dependent on women's participation in the labour market. An increase in females in the STEM workforce could be worth at least two billion to the Scottish economy. But what we are faced with is a stream of women leaving the sector. And now some employees, employers in Scotland are now struggling to recruit. So in short, losing women in the STEM field weakens both Scottish business and the Scottish economy. Now, already we've seen our economy weaken under the current leadership with the most recent GDP figures showing Scotland's economy growing at half the rate of the rest of the UK as a whole. And so without action, we will continue to miss innovation and market opportunities. Now, just last week, I had the pleasure of visiting the Data Lab and meeting with their head of business development, Jude McCorry. Um, she is quite simply passionate about Scotland's role as a leader, both in data research and women in data. And this rapidly growing sector possibly provides an even greater opportunity for women in STEM than perhaps some of the more traditional engineering fields. And this is possibly reflected 
in how she is joined at the top of her field by women such as Dillian, Gillian Doherty, the Chief Executive of Data Lab, Francis Snedden, the Chief Technology Officer at Simulate, and Chief, Exec Ex Chief Executives such as Polly Purvis, Mandy Haben little Julia Grieve, Susan Ramanat of Scotland IS, Scotland Business Resilience Centre, Crichton and Spiritus respectively, many of uh, whom uh, members may have had the opportunity to meet uh, at the event last night. Um, but how do we find the next generation? In March, the Data Lab is putting on a program on women in data science, and it will bring together current female data scientists and schoolgirls to inspire them to become the data leaders of the future. The Royal Society also plans to put on an exhibition in April to showcase women in science in Scotland and celebrate their achievements. So I'm pleased there will be roundtable discussions with representatives from education, business, government, and more to evaluate the report and develop solutions. But the Scottish Government has a responsibility to promote gender equality in STEM fields through its policies on education, training, and economic development. And these are the sort of initiatives that the Scottish Conservatives, and I hope everyone in the Chamber, supports. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burnett. I call James Kelly to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Mr. Mundell will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Kelly, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like other speakers in the debate, can I can congratulate Ian Gray on securing the, the debate this afternoon. I think it's a very important debate to highlight the issue, not only of STEM and the economy, but the importance of getting more women into uh, STEM positions. I think uh, it's very useful that we have the Tapping All Our Talents report because it gives us a benchmark from 2012 from which to measure against. And as Ian Gray pointed out, there had been some progress, but in other, uh, in other aspects, um, progress had, has been slow and in some cases uh, has declined. That should be a real concern to MSPs across all the chamber. Because if you look, if you want Scotland to do well as a country, then we need obviously to grow our economy. And a key factor is, in that has got to be the information technology uh, and engineering sectors. Uh, and not only have we got to get skilled uh, and you know, good people into those sectors, but the fact that we are so short in terms of women recruits, um, you know, for example, in information technology, uh, women only make up 17% of the workforce. It clearly shows not only are we letting women down and not giving them those opportunities, um, but we're also not making the most in terms of tapping into the strengths that can give us uh, economic growth. Um, I think in terms of looking at the issue, uh, you can see that there's a, you know, there's, there's a kind of almost a kind of flow to this problem. There's been a, a decline of, you know, a, a thousand uh, completions uh, in terms of, you know, people entering industry. And you can go all the way down to secondary school uh, and see that in terms of between S3 and S5 in computing subjects, there's been a decline from 32% to 18%. So there's not enough women studying uh, those subjects. Uh, and I think what we actually, one of the things we need to do is to take it all the way back into primary school um, and raise STEM awareness with, with young kids in their formative years so that they, they not only realise the importance of information technology and engineering, but also what uh, an exciting career um, it can be. And I think to do that, STEM subjects should be given a much greater priority in primary schools. There's per perhaps a uh, you know, a kind of natural instinct to concentrate on the traditional sub subjects like English, uh, mathematics and reading. Uh, and, you know, we're not gearing up enough for the modern economy and, and concentrating more on engineering and information technology. I think one way that can be encouraged in primary schools is the use of STEM ambassadors and um, bringing young women in from universities and college who are studying STEM subjects and also from, from industry to, to talk to primary school kids about the importance of, uh, you know, of you know, a, a career in studying in STEM. I know that that's been done in some primary schools in Glasgow and it, you know, it's been very exciting and the, uh, one experience I know of that you know, the young kids were, were, were very enthused by it. Um, 
So I think in, in terms of, I think as Ian Gray said, it's going to need a much more concentrated effort and it needs it across all sectors. So, you know, from primary school through to secondary school and to higher education and also from industry uh, linking in with, the, with, with these sectors because uh, it's absolutely vital if we're going to give women the opportunities they deserve and make the most for the econ economy, we need to learn the lessons from the latest Tapping All Talents report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. I call Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And like other members, can I begin by thanking Ian Gray for bringing this important issue uh, to the Chamber and congratulate him on securing the time. I agree uh, wholeheartedly it's very important that it is men who uh, take to some degree the lead uh, on these issues. I think uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to stand up uh, for genuine equality, but I think this goes further than that. I think it, we all have a responsibility to help uh, build uh, the society we want to see. And this is more than just economic. We all lose out uh, where people are held back and uh, where we don't make the most of what everyone has to offer. Um, and the economic figures are stark. Uh, that figure of 170 million, I think, would go a long way uh, to supporting many initiatives uh, that would unlock further uh, economic potential. And I think that we, we have to ask ourselves, or when we're getting wake-up calls like this more than once and we're not making any progress, are we part of that problem? Um, are we doing enough? Are we doing everything we can? Or do we just pay lip service to these issues and then uh, move on to other things? I know... Uh, that uh, through my own involvement on the Education Committee, you know, that these are in interesting issues, issues uh, that, that members here do take seriously, but it's not enough uh, just to, to take them seriously. We've, we've got to see something done. And I think too often, uh, because there are so many factors involved, because these issues are uh, so complicated and deep-rooted, it's easy to sort of say it's too difficult or the problem lies somewhere else. And I think we, 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 we do have to... Uh, make sure that, that something happens this time because I don't want to see another report like this that, sh that shows progress uh, stagnating. Um, and I think uh, James Kelly um, is right when he's saying we need to, to focus much younger. Um, I would go even further still and say that it's an important part um, at early years uh, level as well. I think you know, both at primary school and at early years there's much more that can be done to help break down gender stereotypes uh, when it comes to, to, to play and learning. I think that it's not saying that, that, that gender isn't important, but I think it's making sure that people do have a free choice. And I'd highlight particularly the point uh, Claire Adamson made in terms of uh, what women want to do as well. Because I think sometimes when we have these debates, we sort of make out that, that, that there are things happening, but I think as well as making sure the opportunities are there, we've got to make sure uh, that, that people actually want to take them up and that's about explaining the, the benefits to, to individuals as well as just saying it would be good for society or it would be good for industry or that we have a skills uh, shortage. Um, which brings me on to industry itself. Um, and I think that it's not just a problem for governments, uh, UK government, Scottish government, uh, or for uh, public bodies. I think we've got to be asking industry to do more. There are lots of good practice um, out there um, with, with companies uh, working hard uh, to support programmes um, with people going into schools or uh, to train people up themselves. But I think uh, it's very clear, um, partly because of economic pressures and other business priorities, that sometimes these issues end up being a little bit tick box. And I think that for large companies uh, who do have capacity to help here, we need to find a way to make it easier for them uh, to, to promote these issues and to make sure uh, that we're getting uh, information uh, to, to young people at the uh, key points of their education. Um, I also, um, as well, think we have to look um, at uh, education in schools and make sure uh, that people do have that genuine range of subject choices um, and uh, that they have the opportunity uh, to access uh, resources at uh, colleges um, not just uh, in school. I think all of those uh, things would help. Um, and uh, I hope uh, that right across this chamber, we'll continue uh, to support initiatives uh, that get right to the heart of this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Richard Lockhead to close the government. Minister, please. Thank you, Presenting Officer. 
And thank you to Ian Gray for bringing forward this debate today. And I have to say he made a very fine opening speech and I agreed with virtually every single point he made uh, during that fine contribution. And indeed, thank you to all the other members. Again, I agreed with virtually every point made by all members across the, the chamber today. And I have to start by saying that the, the government is absolutely committed to addressing gender inequality in society, in the economy and in education as well. And indeed, only yesterday, the First Minister renewed her commitment to tackling gender inequality when she met her National Advisory Council on Women and Girls. And she promised to give full and careful consideration to their first annual report, which was published only last week. So we can all agree today, and we have agreed, that there's no place for gender bias and gender stereotyping that limits the achievements of women and girls in STEM or in any other sector uh, in life. I want to thank the Royal Society of Edinburgh for a, a balanced, a thorough and thought-provoking review of the current state of women in STEM in Scotland today. I know they've arranged a number of follow-up activities uh, following the report, and the Scottish Government have offered to be involved in as many of these activities as they feel would be uh, appropriate. As Ian Gray said, the report does acknowledge the positive progress which has been made in many areas, but of course, progress has not been made in enough areas. And the current situation, I would certainly agree, is simply not good enough, albeit we should recognise where progress has been made. Uh, and uh, James Kelly and Alexander Burnett uh, mentioned some of the statistics also that do illustrate we've got so much more work to do. However, the report did say that uh, in terms of the government that we have driven the equalities agenda far beyond the remit of a dedicated equalities team within governments. It says it's heartened by the progress that has been achieved, notwithstanding the many challenges that still remain. The report also highlights the action that has already been taken at schools and in colleges and universities and apprenticeships as well. Uh, and as James Kelly highlighted, it's really important we do take action in our schools. And some of the initiatives underway in Scotland include the, the Big Me Week, which took place at Ravenswood Primary School in Cumbernauld. Also, the Gender Friendly Physics Programme that took place at Lowman School in Helensburgh. The University of Strathclyde's Engineering the, Engineering the Future for Girls Programme. And equates Scotland's work with West Lothian College and their Career Wise Programme. Just to give a very small uh, set of examples of what's happening across the country uh, in recent months and years. The report also says, of course, that uh, that kind of progress, which I have mentioned, is not universal, and that's, of course, one of our biggest challenges. It points to the ongoing persistent gender imbalance in subjects and in the labour market as well. For example, in the year 2017 to 2018, engineering modern apprenticeships attracted just over 5% of female starts, and only 4% of staff in Scottish early learning and childcare settings are male. The report presents government, education, industry and academia with a set of complex and, and challenging recommendations. We are, as a government, already taking action on some of the themes in the report. Uh, and again, we'll look to how we can do more. In terms of leadership and cultural change, we are providing leadership to drive forward cultural change. Uh, this is the remit of the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls, which I mentioned before. And we're also demonstrating leadership through our work on the gender pay gap, for instance. And latest statistics show that we're currently having the, the lowest gender pay cap on record at 15% for all employees and 5.7% for full-time employees. So still some way to go, but progress has certainly been made. And like the Royal Society, we recognise there's much more to be done, and that's why we have been working intensively with partners and interest groups to develop a gender pay gap action plan for Scotland, and that will be published in the coming months. There are strong similarities between the themes identified in the Tapping All Our Talent report and the themes which will be addressed in the Gender Pay Action Plan. We have also shown leadership by making equity a central theme of our STEM education and training strategy. That strategy includes a range of actions designed to tackle behavioural change and attitudes, again something highlighted by Ian Gray and other members in today's debate. And these are based on evidence and monitoring of what, what actually works. Research strongly suggests there is no inherent difference between girls and boys that limits their interests, their capabilities or ambitions, as again we've confirmed today. Research also suggests that the period between the age of 10 to 14 is a very critical time for the development of young people's attitudes to science. And by age 14, most young people's attitudes are fixed. And for the past three years, the Institute of Physics in partnership with Skills Development Scotland and Education Scotland have been conducting a pilot programme on what, 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 what works best in schools to address gender imbalance in STEM. And that project focused on gender stereotyping and unconscious bias. 
So we know that these shape self-identity and aspiration in young people. And we know that these are the root cause of the gender imbalance which we see in these statistics. And that project found that it's important to start this work early in education, again, as other members have mentioned. It found that uh, whole school approaches that go beyond STEM and into other subjects are needed as well. The project received a very positive evaluation with 97% of participants reporting that they had more confidence in their ability to tackle gender imbalance as a result of having taken part. And both Education Scotland and the Care Inspectorate have published findings from the pilot, which is accessible in an accessible format for teachers and for early learning and childcare providers to use. And under the STEM strategy, or STEM strategy of the government, Education Scotland have appointed a dedicated team of six gender balance and equity equality officers who will develop and spread the best practice from that pilot. And the aim is to ensure that all school clusters in Scotland are involved in that by 2022. And again, of course, we'll monitor that and evaluate it on an ongoing basis. In terms of our colleges and universities, which of course are highlighted in Ian Gray's motion, each college and university has a gender action plan. The Scottish Funding Council requires universities to report on how they are promoting gender equality in their workforce and their governance boards. And it also includes reporting and action taken to address gender imbalance in senior and management staff as well. And at the level of individual students, a social media campaign led by Young Scott is challenging stereotypes and highlighting positive STEM careers and career pathways for students and prospective students at our colleges and universities. There's also a lot of action happening in the workplace as well, and I can speak about that, but uh, it's important we also address what's happening in the workplace. I think Oliver Mundell and others mentioned the importance of ensuring industry are playing their part as well. But we support Equate Scotland in that regard, and they're taking action to promote and encourage women into jobs in STEM sectors. Uh, that includes targeted support for women returning to STEM jobs from a career break, and we're also committed to tackling discrimination in the workplace uh, and promoting fair work practices. And that's all part of the Fair Work Action Plan, which we will publish shortly uh, as well as part of our ambition to make Scotland a fair work nation by 2025. So in conclusion, presenting officer, we could perhaps have another broader debate on this at some future occasion in Parliament. But it's really important to talk about this issue today in light of the Tapping All Our Talents report. I hope I've demonstrated that the government's playing our role in demonstrating uh, leadership and showing leadership and driving cultural change. Our approach focuses on behavioural change and is based on what works. My officials, the government, will continue to work with the Royal Society of Edinburgh and others to seek new and creative ways of addressing many of the challenges that have been raised today. But that partnership approach, of course, is absolutely crucial, involving parents, teachers, employers, and science-based professional bodies uh, also. Claire Adamson uh, highlighted the changing nature of Scotland's economy and ensuring that Scotland is absolutely prepared for those changes. So my assurance today is to make sure we take the lessons from Tapping All Our Talents 2018 as published by the Royal Society for Edinburgh to make sure we are prepared for that. And everyone in Scotland is making their contribution and is their opportunity to realise that vision as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2.30.